Jacques Benigne Lignel Bossuet French BS the 27th of September 1627 to the 12th of April 1704 was a French bishop and theologian renowned for his sermons and other addresses He has been considered by many to be one of the most brilliant orators of all time and a masterly French stylist Court preacher to Louis XIV of France Bossuet was a strong advocate of political absolutism and the divine right of kings he argued that government was divine and that kings received their power from God. He was also an important courtier and politician. The works best known to English speakers are three great orations delivered at the funerals of Queen Henrietta Maria, widow of Charles I of England 1669, her daughter, Henriette, Duchess of Orléans 1670, and the outstanding soldier Le Grand Condé 1687. His work Discours sur l'histoire universelle or Discourse on Universal History 1681 is regarded by many Catholics as an actualization or second edition of the City of God of St. Augustine of Hippo. Biography Early years Basuit was born at Dijon. He came from a family of prosperous Burgundian lawyers. On both his paternal and maternal side, his ancestors had held legal posts for at least a century. He was the fifth son born to Benane Bossuet, a judge of the Parliament a provincial high court at Dijon, and Marguerite Moucher. His parents decided on a career in the church for their fifth son, so he was tonsured at age 10. The boy was sent to school at the Collège des Gaudrons, a classical school run by the Jesuits of Dijon. When his father was appointed to the Parliament at Metz, Bossuet was left in Dijon under the care of his uncle Claude Bossuet d'Isere, a renowned scholar. At the Collège des Gaudrons, he gained a reputation for hard work. Fellow students nicknamed him Boss Soutis Eratro, an ox broken into the plough. His father's influence at Metz allowed him to obtain for the young Bossuet a canonicate in the Cathedral of Metz when the boy was just 13 years old. In 1642, Bossuet enrolled in the Collège de Navarre in Paris to finish his classical studies and to begin the study of philosophy and theology. His mentor at Navarre was the college's president, Nicolas Cornet, the theologian whose denunciation of Antoine Arnauld at the Sorbonne in 1649 was a major episode in the Jansenist controversy. For the time being, however, Cornet and Arnaud were still on good terms. In 1643, Arnaud introduced Bossuet to the Hôtel de Rambouillet, a great centre of aristocratic culture and the original home of the Preciuses. Bossuet was already showing signs of the oratorical brilliance which served him so well throughout his life. On one celebrated occasion at the Hôtel de Rambouillet, during a dispute about extempore preaching, the 16-year-old Bossuet was called on to deliver an impromptu sermon at 11 p.m. Voiture famously quipped. I never heard anybody preach so early nor so late. Topic: <inaudible> Early clerical career. Bossuet became a master of arts in 1643. He held his first thesis, Tentativa, in theology on the 25th of January 1648 in the presence of the Prince de Condé. Later in 1648, he became a subdeacon at Metz. He became a deacon in 1649. During this period, he preached his first sermons. He held his second thesis Sorbonica on November 9, 1650. Then, in preparation for the priesthood, he spent the next two years in retirement under the spiritual direction of Vincent de Paul. <laughs> Priest at Metz In January 1652, Bossuet re-entered public life, being named Archdeacon of Saraborg. He was ordained a priest on 18 March 1652. A few weeks later, he defended his brilliant doctoral work and became a Doctor of Divinity. He spent the next seven years at Metz, where his father's influence had got him a canonry at age 13 and where he now also had the office of Archdeacon. He was plunged at once into the thick of controversy, for nearly half of Metz was Protestant, and Basset's first appearance in print was a refutation of the Huguenot pastor Paul Ferry 1655, and he frequently engaged in religious controversies with Protestants and, less regularly, with Jews during his time at Metz. 
To reconcile the Protestants with the Roman Catholic Church became the great object of his dreams, and for this purpose, he began to train himself carefully for the pulpit, an all-important center of influence in a land where political assemblies were unknown and novels and newspapers scarcely born. His youthful imagination was unbridled, and his ideas ran easily into a kind of paradoxical subtlety, redolent of the divinity school. Nevertheless, his time at Metz was an important time for developing his pulpit oratory and for allowing him to continue his studies of Scripture and the Fathers. He also gained political experience through his participation in the local assembly of the Three Orders. In 1657, in Metz, Bossuet preached before Anne of Austria, mother of Louis XIV. As a result, he received the honorific title of Counselor and Preacher to the King. Early career in Paris In 1657, Saint Vincent de Paul convinced Bossuet to move to Paris and give himself entirely to preaching. He did not entirely sever his connections with the Cathedral of Metz, though, he continued to hold his benefice, and in 1664, when his widower father was ordained as a priest and became a canon at the Cathedral at Metz, Bossuet was named the Dean of the Cathedral. Bossuet quickly gained a reputation as a great preacher, and by 1660, he was preaching regularly before the court in the Chapel Royal. In 1662, he preached his famous sermon, On the Duties of Kings. To Louis XIV at the Louvre, in Paris, the congregations had no mercy on purely clerical logic or clerical taste. If a preacher wished to catch their ear, he had to manage to address them in terms they would agree to consider sensible and well bred. Having very stern ideas of the dignity of a priest, Bossuet refused to descend to the usual devices for arousing popular interest. The narrative element in Bossuet's sermons grew shorter with each year. He never drew satirical pictures like his great rival Louis Bordelouet. He would not write out his discourses in full, much less learn them off by heart. Of the 200 printed in his works, all but a fraction are rough drafts. Ladies such as Mie de Sevigné forsook him when Bordelouet dawned on the Paris horizon in 1669, though Fainelin and La Bruyère, too much sounder critics, refused to follow their example. Bossuet possessed the full equipment of the orator voice, language, flexibility, and strength. He never needed to strain for effect, his genius struck out at a single blow the thought, the feeling and the word. What he said of Martin Luther applies peculiarly to himself, he could fling his fury into theses and thus unite the dry light of argument with the fire and heat of passion. These qualities reached their highest point in the oraisons funebres funeral orations. Bossuet was always best when at work on a large canvas, besides, here no conscientious scruples intervened to prevent him giving much time and thought to the artistic side of his subject. The oration, as its name betokened, stood midway between the sermon proper and what would nowadays be called a biographical sketch. At least that was what Bossuet made it, for on this field, he stood not merely first, but alone. 137 of Bossuet's sermons preached in the period from 1659 to 1669 are extant, and it is estimated that he preached more than a hundred more that have since been lost. Apart from state occasions, Bossuet seldom appeared in a Paris pulpit after 1669. Topic: <inaudible> Tudor to the Dauphin, 1670 to 1681. A favorite of the court, in 1669, Bossuet was gazetted bishop of Condom in Gascony without being obliged to reside there. He was consecrated as a bishop on September 21, 1670, but he resigned the bishopric when he was elected to the Académie Française in 1671. On 18 September 1670 he was appointed tutor to the nine-year-old Dauphin, oldest child of Louis XIV. The choice was scarcely fortunate. Bossuet unbent as far as he could, but his genius was by no means fitted to enter into the feelings of a child, and the Dauphin was a cross, ungainly, sullen lad. Probably no one was happier than the tutor when his charge turned 16 and was married off to a Bavarian princess. Still, the nine years at court were by no means wasted. Basse's tutorial functions involved composing all the necessary books of instruction, including not just handwriting samples, but also manuals of philosophy, history, and religion fit for a future king of France. Among the books written by Bossuet during this period are three classics. First came the Traité de la connaissance de Dieu et de Soi Meme, Treatise on the Knowledge of God and of One's Self, 1677, then the Discours sur l'histoire universelle, Speech of Universal History, 
1679, published 1682, and lastly the Politique tirée de l'écriture saint, Politics drawn from Holy Scripture, 1679, published 1709. The three books fit into each other. The Traité is a general sketch of the nature of God and the nature of man. The Discours is a history of God's dealings with humanity in the past. The Politique is a code of rights and duties drawn up in the light thrown by those dealings. Basse's conclusions are only drawn from Holy Scripture because he wished to gain the highest possible sanction for the institutions of his country and to hallow the France of Louis XIV by proving its astonishing likeness to the Israel of Solomon. Then, too, the veil of Holy Scripture enabled him to speak out more boldly than court etiquette would have otherwise allowed, to remind the son of Louis XIV that kings have duties as well as rights. The Grand Dauphin had often forgotten these duties, but his son, the Petit Dauphin, would bear them in mind. The tutor's imagination looked forward to a time when France would blossom into utopia, with a Christian philosopher on the throne. That is what made him so stalwart a champion of authority in all its forms. Le Roy, Jesus Christ et l'Église, du ncès toi noms. The King, Jesus Christ, and the Church, God in his three names. He says in a characteristic letter. The object of his books is to provide authority with a rational basis. Basse's worship of authority by no means killed his confidence in reason, what it did was make him doubt the honesty of those who reasoned otherwise than himself, the whole chain of argument seemed to him so clear and simple. Philosophy proves that God exists and that he shapes and governs the course of human affairs. History shows that this governance is, for the most part, indirect, exercised through certain venerable corporations, as well civil and ecclesiastical, all of which demand implicit obedience as the immediate representatives of God. Thus all revolt, whether civil or religious, is a direct defiance of the Almighty, Oliver Cromwell becomes a moral monster, and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes was the greatest achievement of the Second Constantine. The France of his youth had known the misery of divided councils and civil war, the France of his manhood, brought together under an absolute sovereign, had suddenly shot up into a splendor only comparable with ancient Rome. Why not, then, strain every nerve to hold innovation at bay and prolong that splendor for all time? Basse's own discourse sur l'histoire universelle might have furnished an answer, for there the fall of many empires is detailed, but then the discourse was composed under a single preoccupation, to Basuit, the establishment of Christianity was the one point of real importance in the whole history of the world. He totally ignores the history of Islam and Asia, on Greece and Rome, he only touched insofar as they formed part of the praeparatio evangelica. Yet his discourse is far more than a theological pamphlet. While Pascal might refer the rise and fall of empires to providence or chance or a little grain of sand in the English Lord Protector's veins, Bossuet held fast to his principle that God works through secondary causes. It is his will that every great change should have its roots in the ages that went before it. Bossuet, accordingly, made a heroic attempt to grapple with origins and causes, and in this way, his book deserves its place as one of the very first of philosophic histories. Topic. Bishop of Meaux, 1681–1704 With the period of the Dauphin's formal education ending in 1681, Basuit was appointed Bishop of Meaux by the King on 2 May 1681, which was approved by Pope Innocent XI on 17 November. But before he could take possession of his see, he was drawn into a violent quarrel between Louis XIV and Pope Innocent XI. Here he found himself in a quandary, to support the Pope meant supporting the Jesuits, and he hated their supposed casuistry and devotion aise almost as much as Pascal. To oppose the Pope was to play into the hands of Louis XIV, who was eager to subject the Church to the will of the state. Basuet therefore attempted to steer a middle course. In 1682, before the General Assembly of the French clergy, he preached a great sermon on the unity of the Church and made it a magnificent plea for compromise. As Louis XIV insisted on his clergy making an anti-papal declaration, Bossuet got leave to draw it up and made it as moderate as he could, and when the Pope declared it null and void, he set to work on a gigantic Defensio Clary Gallicani, only published after his death. Throughout this controversy, unlike the court bishops, Bossuet constantly resided in his diocese and took an active interest in its administration. Topic. Efforts to combat Protestantism The Gallican storm a little abated, he turned back to a project very near his heart. 
Ever since the early days at Metz, he had been busy with schemes for uniting the Huguenots to the Catholic Church. In 1668, he converted to Rennes. In 1670, he published an exposition de la foi catholique, exposition of the Catholic faith, so moderate in tone that adversaries were driven to accuse him of having fraudulently watered down the Catholic dogmas to suit Protestant taste. Finally, in 1688, his great Histoire des variations des églises protestantes, History of the variations of the Protestant churches, perhaps the most brilliant of all his works, appeared. Few writers could have made the justification controversy interesting or even intelligible. His argument is simple enough. Without rules, an organized society cannot hold together, and rules require an authorized interpreter. The Protestant churches had thrown over this interpreter, and Basuit had small trouble in showing that, the longer they lived, the more they varied on increasingly important points. For the moment, the Protestants were pulverized, but before long, they began to ask whether variation was necessarily so great an evil. Between 1691 and 1701, Bossuet corresponded with Leibniz with a view to reunion, but negotiations broke down precisely at this point. Leibniz thought his countrymen might accept individual Roman doctrines, but he flatly refused to guarantee that they would necessarily believe tomorrow what they believe today. We prefer, he said, a church eternally variable and forever moving forwards. Next, Protestant writers began to accumulate some alleged proofs of Rome's own variations, and here, they were backed up by Richard Simon, a priest of the Paris Oratory and the father of biblical criticism in France. He accused Saint Augustine, Basset's own special master, of having corrupted the primitive doctrine of grace. Bossuet set to work on a defense de la tradition, but Simon calmly went on to raise issues graver still. Under a veil of politely ironic circumlocutions, such as did not deceive the Bishop of Meaux, he claimed his right to interpret the Bible like any other book. Bossuet denounced him again and again, Simon told his friends he would wait until the old fellow was no more. Another oratorian proved more dangerous still. Simon had endangered miracles by applying to them lay rules of evidence, but Malbranche abrogated miracles altogether. It was blasphemous, he argued, to suppose that the author of nature would violate the law he had himself established. Bossuet might scribble Nova, Mira, Falsa in the margins of his book and urge Fainalan to attack them. Malbranche politely met his threats by saying that to be refuted by such a pen would do him too much honor. These repeated checks soured Bossuet's temper. In his earlier controversies, he had borne himself with great magnanimity, and the Huguenot ministers he refuted had found him a kindly advocate at court. His approval of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes stopped far short of approving Dragonades within his Diocese of Meaux, but now his patience was waning. A dissertation by one Father Caffaro, an obscure Italian monk, became his excuse for writing certain, violent maximes sur la comédie wherein he made an attack on the memory of Molière, dead more than twenty years. Topic. Controversy with Fainalan Three years later, he was battling with Bishop François Fénelon over the love of God. Fénelon, 24 years his junior, was an old pupil who had suddenly become a rival. Like Bossuet, Fénelon was a bishop who served as a royal tutor. The controversy concerned their different reactions to the opinions of Jean Guyon. Her ideas were similar to the quietism of Molinos, which was condemned by Pope Innocent XI in 1687. When Mie de Maintenon began questioning the orthodoxy of Mie Guyon's opinions, an ecclesiastical commission of three members, including Bossuet, was appointed to report on the matter. The commission issued 34 articles known as the Articles de C, which condemned Mie Guyon's ideas very briefly and provided a short treatise on the orthodox, Catholic conception of prayer. Fainalan, who had been attracted to Mi Guyon's ideas, signed off on the articles, and Mi Guyon submitted to the judgment. Bossuet now composed instructions sur les atats de oraison, a work that explained the articles de C in greater depth. Fainalan refused to endorse this treatise, however, and instead composed his own explanation as to the meaning of the articles de C, his explication des maximes des saints. He explained his view that the goal of human life should be to have love of God as its perfect object, with neither fear of punishment nor desire for the reward of eternal life having anything to do with this pure love of God. King Louis XIV reproached Bossuet for failing to warn him that his grandson's tutor had such unorthodox opinions and instructed Bossuet and other bishops to respond to the Maximes des Saints. Bossuet and Fainalan thus spent the years 1697 1699 battling each other in pamphlets and letters until the Inquisition finally condemned the Maximes des Saints on 12 March 1699. 
Pope Innocent XII selected 23 specific passages for condemnation. Basuit triumphed in the controversy and Fainalin submitted to Rome's determination of the matter. <laughs> Death Until he was over 70 years, Basuit enjoyed good health, but in 1702 he developed chronic kidney stones. Two years later he was a hopeless invalid, and on 12 April 1704 he died quietly. His funeral oration was given by Charles de la Rue, S.J. He was buried at Meaux Cathedral. Preaching Basuit is widely considered to be one of the most influential homileticians of all time. He is one of the preachers, along with John Tillotson and Louis Bordelouet, who began the transition from Baroque to neoclassical preaching. He preached with a simple eloquence that eschewed the grandiose extravagances of earlier preaching. He focused on ethical rather than doctrinal messages, often drawing from the lives of saints or saintly contemporaries as examples. He preached, for example, on St. Francis de Sales as well as funeral orations on Queen Henrietta Maria of France and Henrietta Anne of England. Basset's funeral orations in particular had lasting importance and were translated early into many languages, including English. Such was their power that even Voltaire, normally so antagonistic toward clergy, praised his oratorical excellence. Topic: <laughs> Works. An edition of Basset's sermons was edited by Abbé Labarque in six vols, Paris, 1890, 1896, as the Herves Oratoires de Basuit. His complete works were edited by Latchet in 31 vols, Paris, 1862–1864. Meditation sur la brevete de la vie Refutation du catechisme de Paul Ferry Oraison funèbre de Yolanda de Monterby 1656. Oration funèbre e Valeria Slazer 1657. Panegyrique de Saint Paul 1659. Oraison funèbre de Nicolas Cornet 1663. Oraison funèbre d'Anne d'Autriche 1667. Oraison funèbre de Henriette Marie de France 1669. Oraison funèbre de Henriette d'Ingleterre 1670 Exposition de la doctrine de l'Église catholique sur les matières de controverse 1671 Sermon pour la profession de Mademoiselle de la Vallière 1675 Traité de la connaissance de Dieu et de Soi Meme 1677 Traité du libre arbitre 1677 Logic 1677 published only in 1828 Conference avec le Pasteur Claude 1678 published 1682 Discours sur la histoire universelle or speech of universal history 1681 Politique tire de la culture saint Politics drawn from the very words of holy scripture 1679 published 1709 Sermon sur l'unité de l'église 1682 Oraison funèbre de Marie Thérèse 1683 Oraison funèbre de Anne de Gonzague, Princesse Palatine 1685 Oraison funèbre de Michel Le Tellier 1686 Oraison funèbre de Mie du Blé de Excels 1686 Oraison funèbre du Prince de Condé 1687 Catechisme du Diocese de Meaux 1687 Histoire des variations des églises protestantes 1688 Explication de l'Apocalypse 1689 Avertissements aux protestants I 2 3 1689 Avertissements aux protestants IV V V 1690 to 91 Défense de l'histoire des variations 1690 to 91 Correspondence avec Leibniz 1691 to 93 Défense de la tradition et des saints Pérez 1691 to 93 Traité de la concupiscence 1691 to 93 Lettre au P. Cafaro 1694 to 95 Maximes et réflexions sur la comédie 1694 to 95 Meditation sur l'évangile 1694 to 95 Élévation sur les mystères 1694 to 95 
Instructions sur les états d'Oraison replying to Fainelin, 1697. Relation sur le Quietisme, 1698. Instructions pastorales pour les Protestants, Manual for Protestant Converts to Catholicism, 1701. Topic: Politics drawn from the very words of Holy Scripture. When Bossuet was chosen to be the tutor of the Dauphin, oldest child of Louis XIV, he wrote several works for the edification of his pupil, one of which was Politics derived from the words of Holy Scripture, a discourse on the principles of royal absolutism. The work was published posthumously in 1709. The work consists of several books which are divided into articles and propositions which lay out the nature, characteristics, duties, and resources of royalty. To justify his propositions, Bossuet quotes liberally from the Bible and various psalms. Throughout his essay, Bossuet emphasizes the fact that royal authority comes directly from God and that the person of the king is sacred. In the third book, Bossuet asserts that, God establishes kings as his ministers, and reigns through them over the people. He also states that, the prince must be obeyed on principle, as a matter of religion and of conscience. While he declares the absolute authority of rulers, he emphasizes the fact that kings must use their power only for the public good and that the king is not above the law. For if he sins, he destroys the laws by his example. In Books 6 and 7, Bossuet describes the duties of the subjects to the prince and the special duties of royalty. For Bossuet, the prince was synonymous with the state, which is why, according to him, the subjects of the prince owe the prince the same duties that they owe their country. He also states that, "...only public enemies make a separation between the interest of the prince and the interest of the state." As far as the duties of royalty, the primary goal is the preservation of the state. Basuit describes three ways that this can be achieved, by maintaining a good constitution, making good use of the state's resources, and protecting the state from the dangers and difficulties that threaten it. In Books 9 and 10, Basuit outlines the various resources of royalty arms, wealth, and counsel and how they should be used. In regards to arms, Basuit explains that there are just and unjust grounds for war. Unjust causes include ambitious conquest, pillage, and jealousy. As far as wealth is concerned, he then lays out the types of expenditures that a king has and the various sources of wealth for the kingdom. He emphasizes that the true wealth of a kingdom is its men and says that it is important to improve the people's lot and that there would be no more poor. Trivia The Catholic Encyclopedia 1913 calls Basuit the greatest pulpit orator of all time, ranking him even ahead of Augustine and Chrysostom. The exterior of Harvard's Sanders Theater includes busts of the eight greatest orators of all time. They include a bust of Basuit alongside such giants of oratory as Demosthenes, Cicero, and Chrysostom. A character in Les Miserables, being from Mo and an orator, is nicknamed Basuit by his friends. Basuit was one of several co editors on the Delphin Classics collection. Basuit was the uncle of Louis Basuit. See also List of works by Eugene Guillaume Topic Notes Topic References Basuit, Jacques Benign, nineteen eighty seven Politics derived from the words of Holy Scripture in Baker, Keith Michael, The Old Regime and the French Revolution, Chicago, Illinois, The University of Chicago Press, pp. 31-47 Edwards, Jr., O.C. Varieties of Sermon, a Survey. In Einatten, Joris Van, Preaching, Sermon and Culture Change in the Long Eighteenth Century, p. 11 Jacoby, W. Pierre, 1982. The Classical Sermon and the French Literary Tradition. Australian Journal of French Studies, 19 227 242. Jacques Benign Bossuet, New Advent. Ritzler, Remigius, Seffrin, Pirminus, 1952, Hierarchia Catholica Medi et Recentis Aeviv, 1667-1730, Padovi, Messagero di S. Antonio, p. 263. Worcester, Thomas. The Classical Sermon. 
In Einatten, Joris Van, Preaching, Sermon and Culture Change in the Long 18th Century, pp. 134, 154 Voltaire 1957, Pomo, René, ed., Herves Historiques, Paris, pp. 1005-1006 Attribution This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Nothcote, Stafford Henry 1911. Bossuet, Jacques Benigne. In Chisholm, Hugh, Encyclopædia Britannica, 4, 11th ed., Cambridge University Press, pp. 287–289. External links Connell, Archibald Browning 1878. Jacques Benigne Bossuet. Encyclopædia Britannica, 4, 9th ed., pp. 70–72. Works by or about Jacques Benigne Bossuet at Internet Archive Works by Jacques Benigne Bossuet at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Discours sur l'histoire universelle French text 1681 PDF Catholic Encyclopedia article, Jacques Benign Bossuet In French Livre audio MP3 gratuit, Oraison funèbre de Henriette Anne d'Angleterre, Duchess d'Orléans Oraison funèbre de Henriette Marie de France, Reine de la Grande-Bretagne.